right here. So good afternoon to everyone who's tuned in today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you also to Leah for the introductions and to the National Collaborating Center for Environmental Health for the invitation to share our project with you today. My name is Bo Shane and presenting with me today is my colleague, Amanda Scales, and we are here from Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health. We would like to begin today by acknowledging that the land on which we gather and on which Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health operates is part of the treaty lands and territory that is the traditional, current and future homes of many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. Today, my colleague Amanda and I are joining from the city of Guelph and we would like to acknowledge that Guelph is situated on the ancestral homelands of the Anishinaabek peoples, specifically the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And also that today, Guelph continues to be the home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We are pleased to share with you an overview of a project that we undertook a few years ago now, known as our Healthy Community Design Baseline Indicators Project. We are very excited for this opportunity, not only to share the project with you, but also for the chance to potentially connect with those in the audience, uh, anyone working or interested in healthy built environments. So we do really encourage you to reach out to Amanda and I after the presentation with additional questions, or if you simply are interested in connecting and our contact information will be provided at the end. Lastly, before we're moving forwards with the presentation, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge our colleague and the project lead, Brianne Petrina. Brianne was not only the project lead, but she came up with a concept from which the project bloomed. And it's very much her passion and drive um, for which is the re her passion and drive are really the reasons the project was a success that it was. Um, Brianne is currently on parental leave. Um, otherwise, she certainly would be here presenting with us today. So we'd like to start by discussing healthy built environments. Uh, so there is a strong relationship between population health and the built environment in which we live, work and play. And this relationship is really well laid out and explained in a resource known as the BCCDC's Healthy Built Environment Linkages Toolkit. Um, this resource is likely familiar to many of those who are tuned in today. Uh, and an infographic from that resource is displayed on the left-hand side, providing a framework for healthy built environments. The BCCDC's toolkit describes how population health is influenced by the design of our neighborhoods, transportation systems, natural environments, food systems, and housing. Now our team began using this framework back in 2014, roughly, to guide our built environment programs in general. And then when we embarked on this baseline project, we adapted the framework with permission to guide this, this work that we're sharing with you today. So this body of evidence that links built environment with healthy behaviors and health outcomes provides us with an opportunity to identify health-based indicators that measure healthy community design. Consequently, this project set out to identify healthy community design indicators that are based on four features from the framework you see on the, uh, on the slide today. So those four features are neighborhood design, transportation networks, natural environments, and food systems. You might notice that the framework includes a housing domain, which was not included in this project due in part to the nature of the project, but also to keep the project scope manageable. So to undertake this work, we partnered with three local municipalities to develop customized indicators and establish baseline measures for each of those three communities. So there were three key objectives for this baseline project. First, to assess residents' preferences as they relate to community design as well as collect information on whether residents report using active travel to access amenities within their neighborhood. Second, to gain an understanding of residents' knowledge of the relationship between health and community design. And third, to collaborate with our municipal planning departments to collect data to measure physical features of community design. This data was used to measure things like connectivity and density. In this presentation, we will use the term physical form 
to refer to the physical features of community design. So as noted on the previous slide, the project was planned and implemented collaboratively with three local municipalities. We held meetings with planning staff and GIS specialists from each municipality to identify indicators. And we really looked to those partnerships to ensure that the indicators identified met local needs and local priority areas. So through these partnerships, two data collection methods were used to identify indicators. First, a survey was used to collect resident perceptions about the link between community design and health. And the survey also asked residents about their self-reported travel behavior. Second, the physical form data piece. Existing data about the physical features of the community was collected, analyzed, and mapped. This physical form data was sourced primarily through GIS specialists with the municipality and also through municipal open data portals. At the time of the project was being planned and developed, to our knowledge, there were no other projects at that point in time that used both types of data in parallel that I'm showing you on this slide. And we saw great value in collecting both resident preferences, perceptions, and behaviors alongside the physical measures of a community. And although there are some limitations to using a survey for collecting some of this data based on the existing resource we had available, this was the best method we had to gather that type of data. I would also like to pause for a moment to highlight that we actually partnered with a fourth community that we don't have time to touch on today. With that fourth community, we only collected survey data and not the physical form data piece due to existing resources within that municipality. And we're flagging that today just in case any of you are working with smaller communities where there might be limited resources and staff available to support the project. The survey data piece was still very valuable to this fourth community. So before we take you through an overview of the survey and the physical form data collection and analysis, we're going to take a moment to explain to you how the communities were divided up into smaller areas for data analysis. So for the purposes of establishing baseline measures, each community was divided into smaller study areas that we called assessment areas. As much as possible, the indicator data was reported at the assessment area level. Now, when delineating these assessment areas, a few different factors were taken into consideration. As a starting point, Statistics Canada dissemination areas, or DAs, were used as building blocks to build the larger assessment areas you see on the map on the left-hand side. Uh, this allowed us to bring in census data um, as it was applicable or, or as, as needed for the different indicators. We also aim to keep the population size between the different assessment areas similar. And lastly, we looked at existing neighborhood characteristics. So working with our planning departments, we identified neighborhoods that were similar and did our best to group those together in the same assessment area where that was feasible. For example, neighborhoods that were adjacent. So the map here on this slide on the left-hand side shows you our largest community we worked with. They had a population of roughly 130,000 residents and their community was divided into five assessment areas. The other two communities you work with were smaller and they were divided into two assessment areas. So as we mentioned a bit earlier, there were two data collection methods used, the first being a survey. So in the next few slides, we'll take you through an overview of that survey. So our neighborhood design survey was used to collect resident perception-based indicators. We partnered with three municipalities, again, with populations ranging between roughly 20,000, ranging up to about 130,000 residents. In partnership with those planning teams, survey questions were tailored for each community. Uh, survey participants were recruited through three methods, online, telephone, and intercept surveys, which were random in-person interviews in public spaces. This mixture of recruitment methods was used to try to increase our response rate, but also to try our best to work towards getting appropriate geographic representation between the different assessment areas within each community. In the survey, respondents were asked for their postal code, and this was used to assign the respondent to the appropriate assessment level, uh, assessment area. 
Um, this enabled us to report the survey data at the assessment area level when significance testing of that data demonstrated differences between different assessment areas. So getting back to the recruitment methods, online was the primary method through which participants were recruited, and then geo-targeted random digit dialing, telephone recruitment, combined with the intercept surveys, which were the in-person surveys in public spaces, those were used to try to bring up a response rate and to target certain geographies. So where it was possible, the intercept surveys were done in locations where we had a lower response rate. Um, as the survey was ongoing, we were sort of monitoring the response rate in each assessment area. So that gives you a, a snapshot of how the survey data was collected and analyzed. So next, we'll show you some examples of the types of questions that were actually asked in the survey. So to start out, there were a group of questions that collected information on residents' perception of their ability to travel actively within their neighborhoods, travel actively to destinations, meaning being able to walk, bike, or roll to those destinations. And then combined with that, we collected data on their self-reported active travel behavior within their neighborhoods. So how did we do this and what did this look like? So to collect the first piece, their perception of their ability to travel in their neighborhoods using walking, biking, or rolling, uh, we asked residents to identify locations or destinations that they felt that they could walk, bike, or roll to. And they did so by selecting from a list of destinations that were in the survey. Destinations like work, schools, trails, community gardens, etc. Following that question, the respondent was asked, was shown a list of those destinations that they had just identified that they felt that they could walk, bike, or roll to. And they were asked whether they had actually walked, biked, or rolled to those destinations within the past three months. So next, the survey went through a series of questions that relied on images to support the question. Shown on the slide are various pairs, or two pairs of images that were taken from the survey. You'll see two pictures, and each picture either has a description directly above or just to the right hand side and that's what survey participants saw. They would see one pair of images at a time. Within each pair there would be one image that showed a more ideal design and another image that showed a less ideal design and when we say more or less we mean more or less um, uh, designed to promote healthy behaviors. So while looking at one pair of images Residents were asked a series of questions. First, they were asked whether they had a preference between the two neighborhoods they were looking at. Secondly, they were asked whether either one of those neighborhoods more closely resembled their current neighborhood in which they lived. And lastly, they were asked whether they felt that either neighborhood promoted certain behaviors, for example, walking, biking, or rolling to local destinations, um, socializing more with neighbors, or driving less. Now, this idea behind pairing images of more or less ideal design is perhaps familiar to some of those in the audience. If you've seen work by Dr. Larry Frank or his colleagues, Christopher Learson and Jim Chapman, similar types of images and questions were posed in surveys they developed. And we actually reached out to them and used and adapted some of their images with permission for our neighborhood design survey. One last thing that's worth noting is that although we worked with three communities, the intent was never to compare between communities, but rather to develop customized indicators and baselines for each community to inform local uh, decision-making and monitor local growth. So looking back at the data collection methods we used, we've just finished going through an overview of the survey. And next we'll move on to a brief overview of the physical form data and how it was collected and analyzed. So again, working really closely with our municipal partners, um, having meetings with planners and GIS specialists, we identified existing data sets that could support developing indicators that measured the physical form or the physical features of community design. These facilitated brainstorming sessions we held with the project team were guided by the BCCDC framework that we showed you at the beginning of the presentation and that are shown again on this slide here. 
Using this framework, a list of priority areas were identified by each municipality. And the project team brainstormed a long list of indicators for each of those priorities. Uh, this long list was then further refined by considering the communication power of the indicator, the proxy power of the indicator, and the data power. And the last one looking at whether the data was readily available and reliable in terms of the data sets that the project team had access to. So again, similar to the survey questions, the intent was to develop customized indicators or customized baselines for each community. Consequently, the types and the total number of indicators between the three communities did vary a little bit. Now this slide shows you some examples of the physical form indicators that were used in the study. If you look up on the right, uh, sorry, on the left side at the top in purple, you'll see a few examples under transportation networks. For example, percentage of the dwellings that were within 800 meter distance of various destinations. 800 meters was used to approximate a 10 minute walk. Uh, this was calculated using the road network rather than drawing a perfect circle with an 800 meter radius around those destinations. Uh, on the top right hand side uh, for the neighborhood desi uh, design features area, uh, various density measures were used like dwelling density or intersection density. Under natural environments, you see street trees per kilometer of road was one of the indicators. And this slide shows you a selection of the indicators. There were roughly 15 to 20 indicators selected for each community. So now we'll use this slide to help walk you through how one of the physical form indicators was uh, the data, how the data was collected and how it was analyzed. Um, if you look at the reports for each community, and we'll provide you with a link to find those reports at the end of the presentation, Within the reports for each indicator, a description of the data is provided to outline the source of the data, how it was calculated, and what it tells us. So the example here is the sidewalk to road ratio indicator. So I'm going to draw your attention first to the larger map on the left hand side of the screen. This shows you what, in essence, what is the raw data. It shows you the road network overlaying with the sidewalk data. The roads data came from mostly from the Ontario Road Network, which is a provincial database. However, our internal public health uh, data analytics team had augmented this data set to ensure it was entirely completely up to date um, at that point in time. Uh, data on sidewalks was collected and maintained by the city. Uh, and then ArcGIS was used to analyze these data sets and produce the maps you see today that we use to share the results. Now I'm gonna draw your attention to the map on the right-hand side. This shows the sidewalk to road ratio reported at the dissemination area level. So each of those little tiny blocks that are colored different colors are different dissemination areas. The darker blue shows you a higher ratio, meaning there are more sidewalks within that little geographic unit. And the pale yellow shows you a lower ratio. So there are fewer sidewalks within that geographic unit. Uh, now, note that if there were sidewalks on both sides of the roads, both of those segments were counted towards the total kilometers of sidewalks within that spatial unit. And while there are limitations to using this approach, it's reasonable to assume that a ratio that is closer to two indicates that there are sidewalks on both sides of the roads, and that a ratio closer to one suggests roughly that there are about so there are sidewalks on, on one side of most of the roads. Of course, there could be some roads that have sidewalks on both sides and some that have sidewalks on no sides within that, that spatial unit that's being analyzed. And so it's an approximation and there are some limitations that have to be acknowledged. And finally, I'm gonna bring your attention to the table on the top right side of the slide. This shows you the sidewalk to road ratio reported at the assessment area level. Now that we have data from the survey, and we have data of physical form indicators collected and analyzed. Both data sets are analyzed at the assessment area level. And we have a fairly wide spectrum of indicators. Looking at all this information together, our project team started to see stories emerge about the different communities. And so I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague, Amanda, to share some of these findings with you. Great, thank you, Bo, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So we wanted to show you a few examples of how that survey data and the physical form data aligned 
and what analysis looked like when we made connections among both types of baseline indicator data. So this first example is from our largest populated community, the city of Guelph, which was divided into five assessment areas. The neighborhood design survey asked residents to think about their neighborhood and to select from a list of locations those that they felt they could walk, bike, or roll to. Locations included places like the park or green space, school, work, grocery store, bus stop, healthcare provider, etc. The majority of residents did report that they could actively travel to at least five of those 13 listed destinations. But interestingly, the bus stop was one of the locations most frequently selected across, res across all of the assessment areas, with 93% of residents reporting that they could actively travel to one. This finding was then validated when we took a look at the physical form design indicators and spatially mapped the percentage of dwellings within 800 meters, which again, we deemed as a, as a 10 minute walk of a bus stop. So you'll see um, the summary table on the right there um, that outlines the percentage of dwellings within this 800 meters to a bus stop across the five assessment areas. It ranged from 91 to 100%. The map on the left is the more detailed label map with the small yellow dots representing all of the bus stops and the green outline encompassing all of the residential dwellings that were within this proximity to a bus stop. Now you'll notice that the green outline encompasses the majority of the map with the least amount of coverage in that south area at the bottom of the map there um, that we also noted in the summary table as being the, the lowest measure. Now the map on the right, the more colored map, is the same data, um, but it's more obvious of the assessment areas with those bold black lines indicating the boundaries of the five assessment areas. So on this map, the, the darker colors representing a larger proportion or a greater proportion of residential dwellings within 800 meters of a bus stop, and then the lighter colors indicating a lower proportion. So overall, access to bus transit was identified as, an, as a strong asset in this community with bus routes extending throughout the majority of the city. A total of 96% of all residential dwellings were within that 800 meters of a bus stop. And we know that in addition to walking, biking and rolling, that public transit does support active transportation within a community and provides both health and environmental benefits. Additionally, when planning and development that further enhances connectivity, like through the use of sidewalks and bicycle lanes and other direct connections of neighborhoods to transit routes, it really makes transit more accessible. And these like, design elements can enable residents to move freely about their neighborhoods, feel more connected and access amenities and services throughout the community. This next example, from the Township of Centre of Wellington, examines the connections and analysis of two of our physical form indicators. So this municipality was actually divided into two assessment areas for the project. Um, they were aligned to match with the urban centre boundary stated in the official plan. And for reference for you on the maps there, they're labeled as Alora and Fergus. So the physical form indicator map on the left illustrates the percent of population change across the community from 2011 to 2016. The darker colors indicating the greatest measures of population growth are primarily evident in those peripheral areas around the map outside of the urban centers. The lighter colors indicating negative population change or less growth are located in the closer um, or in the areas closer to the urban core of Alora, and then the northeast and southeast areas around Fergus. So as the map illustrates by those darker colors, the greatest population growth for this community over the five-year period occurred outside of the main urban centers. Now take a look at the map on the right. The map illustrates intersection density, which was a which was an indicator that we used to describe describe street connectivity. The darker colors and more black dots indicating greater measures of intersections per hectare and therefore more connectivity are primarily evident in the in the urban center areas of Alora and Fergus. And then the lighter colors 
and then and less black dots indicating lower measures of intersections per density or intersections per hectare and therefore less connectivity are primarily located around the periphery of the map outside of those main urban core. And so when we considered these two types of indicators side by side, it became clear to us that those areas with the fastest growing populations also measured the lowest in connectivity. So then we took a look at the neighborhood design survey for the questions that we asked residents about connectivity. What we determined was that 76% of residents recognized the benefits of a connected neighborhood design. They recognized that um, a connected neighborhood design encourages healthy behaviors like active transportation, reducing vehicle use, increasing social interactions and feelings of safety. So then when we made connections among all of these data indicators, it revealed an opportunity for promoting neighborhood connectivity in the growing areas of this community. One recommendation from the report was to add public health to the circulation list to review policy and land use development applications for this community and to provide comments on healthy community design principles such as connectivity wherever appropriate. In this next example from our third community, the town of Orangeville, the study community was also divided into two assessment areas, um, which we, we called the core and the external, differentiating between the more urban central downtown areas compared to the outer peripheral areas of town. The maps on the next slide will actually illustrate this for you, but what we wanted to do first was show you what we heard from residents in the neighborhood design survey. So as you'll recall from the previous example, residents completing the survey were asked to think about their neighborhoods and to identify locations in which they felt they could actively travel to, so walk, bike, or roll to. Some of the top locations are, are shown on the screen, but what stood out to us the most was that the findings revealed that more residents, 78%, from the external areas of town felt that they could actively travel to common destinations compared to residents of the core area. Then for the locations that residents indicated they could actively travel to, residents were asked in the next survey question whether or not they actually did walk, bike, or roll to those locations in the past three months. Again, interestingly enough, the findings have revealed that 65% of residents from the external areas of town reported that they actually actively traveled to the locations that they felt they could, compared to only 56% of residents living in the downtown core area. We found these findings really interesting and it sparked our curiosity to learn a little bit more about why it was reported this way. The physical form design indicators for this community really helped explain the contributing factors in the built design that supports residents' ability to travel actively. So take a moment here now to um, locate the two assessment areas on the map. For reference, you'll notice that there's two labels for the external assessment area, and then that central piece marking the core area. So the map on the left illustrates the inter, or, sorry, um, illustrates the indicators on the total meters of trail per hectare area. So the bold red lines outline the specific trail networks, and you'll notice that they extend throughout both the core and external areas of the map. The darkest areas representing the highest measures of trails per hectare are located in the north and northwest regions of the external assessment area the dark colors there, and then the northern regions of the core assessment area. So this spatial mapping illustrates the extensive trail coverage across both assessment areas, but especially in that external area, which measured at 14.5 meters per hectare. Then the central urban core area measured at 10.5 meters per hectare. On the right, the indicator map illustrates the percentage of dwellings within 800 meters of a park or green space. Again, the darker colors represent a greater proportion of dwellings that were within this proximity to a park. The community parks are also labeled on the map there for you with that red shading encompassing all of the residential dwellings that met this measure. 
So as you can see, the red shading does encompass the majority of this map, um, showing that the vast majority of dwellings in this community are within 800 meters of a park or green space. And specifically, 93% of all dwellings were within this 800 meter um, proximity. So now what does this all mean and how does it connect to the survey findings? Well, if you'll recall from that last slide, the survey findings show that the majority of residents of this community did report active travel, but especially more residents from the external area perceived and actually traveled to common destinations compared to the core assessment area, residents from that core assessment area. So then just for fun, we'll bring in one more survey finding. The survey did ask residents to imagine moving to a different neighborhood and to indicate the importance of being able to walk, bike, or roll to a list of various destinations. What we found was that 64% of residents stated that it was important to be able to travel actively to outdoor recreation destinations. So when we interpreted all of these data indicators together, what appeared to be driving active transportation within this community was the easy access to trails, parks, green space and outdoors for exercise. The extensive trail network within this community connects many community amenities, including not only the parks and green space, but also community centers and the downtown core, really making it easy for residents to utilize for recreation and for transportation. So these were really big strengths identified in the healthy built design for this community, the town of Orangeville. And so one of the recommendations for this community was to ensure that this data, all of this indicator data was shared with other community partners. So for example, committees working on parks, recreation and trails related policy plans could really benefit using this baseline data to support future funding and efforts towards ma maintaining and developing new trail systems. And to date, the report data has been used in this community by various committees and community engagement groups. In particular, one, um, a, a sustainable neighborhood action plan report from this community did utilize and reference various measures from this baseline indicator project and even identified additional um, metrics that they'd like to collect, including a more comprehensive tree canopy study. Um, and recently we did hear that the town is going to undertake this kind of study later this year. So that's great news as well. So those are just a few examples of how pairing the two types of indicator data and making connections among multiple indicators really started to paint that picture and share a story of the built design in each community that really didn't exist before. So we encourage you to view the reports to see more examples from each community. Um, as we already mentioned, I think the baseline data from both the survey and physical form, they were compiled and presented to municipalities. And then we worked together to create these tailored recommendations for healthy community design based upon the survey or based upon the study findings um, and other best practice evidence. Uh, recommendations from the reports, they focused on how public health can collaborate with and assist municipal planning and other departments to create supportive environments that foster the health and well-being of all residents. Um, for example, some things were public awareness and education campaigns or resources, using the data to inform policy documents, community improvement or sustainability plans, and then other healthy community design infrastructure and built environment initiatives. Then of course, since this is baseline level data, as part of the project, we did establish data sharing agreements with each community with the intent to recollect and measure the indicator data again in five, in five year increments, so five, 10 and 15 years from baseline. And this way, the impact on different indicators due to interventions, um, planning decisions and growth can really be monitored over time. And then also as capacity allows, we would like to explore the links of indicator of this indicator data with other public health data to examine things like injury rates, chronic disease, um, SDOH, climate change, et cetera. Another exciting opportunity that stemmed from the baseline project was our agency's participation and success in winning the Mars Innovation Challenge in 2020. 
So for those of you that don't know, Mars Discovery District is based in Toronto, Ontario, um, and it works with startups and partners across four sectors, one of which being the health sector, with a focus on improving the healthcare system and helping people enjoy longer, healthier lives. So Mars launched an innovation challenge competition called the Healthy Neighborhoods, De Healthy Neighborhoods Data Challenge. And the competition challenged participants to use data in a way to better understand the physical environment and to support the design of healthier neighborhoods. So Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health presented the Built for Health Index, which we refer to as the BHI. And it's a user-friendly tool that measures indicators linked to healthy built environments. The Built for Health Index is comprised of 23 metrics, which included data indicators presented from the baseline project, as well as some additional ones. And then the BHI output produces a score ranging from one to 10 for each area of interest with a score of one would indicate that the built area was less encouraging of healthy behaviors, and then a score of 10 would indicate that the built area was more encouraging of healthy behaviors. So using this BHI output, agencies can then work together to make evidence-informed decisions about how communities are designed to support health. So the BHI was um, completed for just one of the three communities that we studied in the baseline project. But the BHI can be replicated in other communities, regardless of size, um, as long as there's access to the relevant data sources and data analysis, GIS, um, and other built environment expertise and skills. Um, and as well, those strong community partnerships are vital. So the team also developed a BHI creation and implementation guide to support interested communities in mobilizing such a tool. Now, um, this this guide did include supportive materials and templates, but they're not yet finalized due to delays from the pandemic. Um, but if you do have any other questions about this work, please do reach out and we can connect you to our colleagues that, that are working on this. So as with many projects, there are a few limitations to the baseline project that we wanted to be sure to mention. Firstly, the creation of the neighborhood design survey tool. Since the survey was um, developed specifically for this project, and although we did research other validated tools to help develop this one, the tool itself was not, um, was not validated. This step also took a great deal of time to ensure you know, that the, the survey was tailored appropriately for each community and that it was suitable to the needs of our project overall. Secondly, it was a challenge to recruit a representative sample of survey respondents from the population in each community. So to compensate for this, statistical weighting was used to adjust for differences in age, gender, and education between the sample and the general population. But we do know that weighting doesn't guarantee that the responses are representative of the population. Um, and additionally, these findings, since they are presented um, and specific to the community, they're therefore not transferable to other populations of interest. Um, it's also worth noting that the indicators collected, they were based on current growth priorities identified by the municipalities and the best quality data available at that time. So this means that the baseline data, um, it represents a comprehensive understanding of these priorities at that point in time, but in future cycles of data collection, additional priorities and new data sources, they may be added to create a more fulsome picture of the built environment in each of these communities. And lastly, there were some minor limitations associated with the original data sets and mapping techniques. So just to summarize for you, the baseline project provided three local municipalities with a baseline understanding of their built environments. This data will provide an enhanced understanding of the needs and priorities of each community and enable public health, community planners, and decision makers to consciously tailor ongoing community design in a way that most effectively meets these needs. The creation of a baseline allows for ongoing data monitoring as the communities grow and to ensure the health and well being of residents are, priority, are, are prioritized um, in land use planning and growth decisions within each community. Um, just to mention, the relationship and engagement with our municipal planning departments was essential to this project's success. So the buy-in and collaboration was very important 
so that the, the work of the project was valued and beneficial to both parties. So we do recommend that establishing this relationship early on um, is really important for others looking to do such work. As mentioned previously, you can find the full reports from each community on our website. The quick link is um, on the screen there for you. And we've also provided a reference for the publication of this work in the Canadian Journal of Public Health. And we can post both of these links in the chat for you. So we wanted to just take a moment here to um, acknowledge the contributions to this project. So at the beginning, we did mention that the main project lead could not be here today. However, as you can imagine, there was a large project team behind this work. Um, too many to list individually, but we wanted to give special mention to um, the, municip the municipal planners, the GIS specialists, epidemiologists, data analysts, data scientists, and many other municipal and public health staff. And then of course, a big thank you goes out to our incredible municipal partners in this work, the town of Orangeville, the township of the center of Wellington, the city of Guelph, and also to the town of Shelburne, which was that fourth community we that we mentioned completed the survey portion of this baseline project. This project really could not have been completed without all of their input, support, and efforts. So we will leave it at that, and hopefully there's a few minutes